Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Spark Your Fire. It's 2024, um, and it's our first time that we're getting back together with John. Look at how bright he is after all the, <laughs> after after all the holidays that uh, you know he's shining with glows on his face. I'm assuming that's from camp. <laughs> that's acne, actually. That's uh, I've got oily skin. Uh, that's, that's acne. Oh, plus a bit. Of, I'm sun kissed as well. But uh, yeah, it's good to be back uh, in the saddle and uh, looking forward to our, our you know conversations, which are always great. So uh, nice to see you again. Likewise, mate. Likewise, not being too tan, I've got to say, from someone who just came back from camping. So <laughs> true. That's very good. Look, 2024 is here. And as a matter of fact, but, you know, when we're recording this episode, we're actually on pretty much the start of February already. So, um, you know, where did January go? It's um, when everyone thought it was a quiet month, but it just flies by. Hope everyone's already done some goal settings this year um, and hope your property goals are all tracking along um, so far. I think for this uh, for this episode, what John and I thought uh, is that, you know, we, we want to share some of our observations and learnings from 2023 so you know you can only learn from by looking at the past and reviewing what you have done right so you know, i think 2023 has certainly taught us quite a few things uh in that sense so we're going to do a bit of retrospective um in terms of what we have observed and what we think is worth sharing and using that as a discussion point um to say what can we do maybe differently or um what can we avoid make, making the same mistake in terms of what uh, from 2023 okay so we are each going to take uh, bringing on the table around three, two to three observations slash lessons learned in terms of what we think should have been um, a good lessons learned from 2023. So, John, how does that sound? Sounds would good. you like me to start? Or would you like you? Would you like to start? Yeah, you you go first. I th- uh, your, yours are good. <laughs> All right, I'll share. I'll I'll start with mine then. Okay, so the first observation that I had uh, is. Um, I was quite amazed uh, at how a state policy can really impact property prices uh, growth. So then this is alluding to the Victorian government. So um, if you cast your mind back into 2023, when um, when the previous Victorian state premier is still around, um, there has been a few rules in regards to uh, land tax increases, even though it was meant to be a temporary measure, but it was land tax increases. And uh, there was an extra tax for A and B and B as well. So, you know, to a degree, I think I saw something like a bit of a daylight robbery statement to a degree um, from various property investors and commentators and that kind of stuff because they now need to grab money in order to fill the budget um, shortfall that they have. Okay, so... This action has actually impacted the Melbourne market or the Victorian market directly. And as a result of that, I think that's why we're currently seeing a massive exodus of investors getting out of the Victorian market. Now, uh, Victorian market has generally speaking been a very low yield market. So on a high interest rate environment, well, I shouldn't say on an interest rate environment today, it's going to be very, very negative from a cash flow perspective. So that's one of the reasons why I suppose some of the reasons, some why some of the investors may have exited is to try to take the profit and uh, put that in, uh, into something that's potentially a better yield. But I think a lot of that decision to exit that market also comes from the state policy, like I mentioned before. So, um, and that subsequently lead to now what we're seeing is for the first time Brisbane median price has actually surpassed the Melbourne median price yeah. uh, which is amazing right like we're not we're not surpassing by much but the trend we can see from the trend the Brisbane is still going strong whereas Melbourne at the moment is very very yeah. subdued okay so that's definitely one of the key takeaways that I that I took out is you know um, whilst these state policies are not something that we can control, but I was very, very surprised to see how much impact it had in terms of the investor mentality, as well as investors' decision to see what they will do subsequent to that. Um, yep. John, any thoughts on this? Uh, just, a, just a really quick one. So firstly, I agree. It was a very interesting observation and I like it. Um, capital flows to where it's treated the best. Mm. Uh, and, and at, right, you know, this is a lesson for our politicians that you need to make these places friendly for investors, friendly for, um, uh, for, for capital, because 
uh, we shouldn't be resting on our laurels. I mean, places like California, to take an international example, people are fleeing California and their population's going down for the first time in like 250 years. So uh, Victoria needs to learn the same lessons. People aren't going to stay in a place just because the weather's nice. It need, they need to be treated well and their investments need to be treated well. So, mm. uh, yeah, capital goes where it's treated the best. True. And I think um, also previous to 2024, I think it was 2022. Remember at that time, I think the Queensland Premier announced that they're going to charge uh, land tax based on an aggregated level across right. the whole Australia, right? So that also pissed off quite a few investors in Queensland. And I know uh, a yeah. few, few investors have actually sold out on that as well. So again, that's a classic example of how the state policy can impact in terms of the the the, the property prices growth, um, mm. which is yeah, I find that very fascinating. So I thought I'll, I'll share that as one of the observations. Certainly, you shouldn't be making a investment decision just purely based on the state policy, but keeping in mind that it does have an impact in terms of your future growth and prospects as well. The SEQ, uh, like the land tax, <laughs> didn't eventuate, thankfully. Um, otherwise, everyone will be paying a premium now for anyone who's owning properties in Southeast Queensland and have to pay a hefty land tax bill. So it ended up being a false alarm. Um, so I guess yeah. one thing to take away, don't panic. Investors, don't panic with these things that go against you. And there will always be times where the winds go against you and there will be times that winds go with you as well. So ride the waves. Um all right, so that's first my first lesson. Um, actually, let's make it interesting. John, why don't you share your first lesson and we'll, we'll, we'll come. Ah, fair enough. Let's yeah, let's, uh, mixing it up in a pot as, uh, um, what's his name, Burgundy uh, from uh, Anchorman said? That's it. Mixing it up in a pot. All right. So the first, my first one's really obvious. Uh, my first lesson for 2023 is that you need to have cash buffers. Uh, so... Uh, so going into 2023, I think uh, it would have been a brave person to uh, to forecast, say, 13 rate increases in 12 months or whatever it was. I know they started a little bit in 2022, mm -hmm. but uh, but yeah, the 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 people who survived the year were the people who who went in with with cash buffers. Now we always talk about cash buffers. Everyone talks about cash buffers, and people have different ways of measuring it. You know, maybe it's. Um, one year worth of salary or six, you know, three years, three months worth of salary, whatever it is, but you need to decide for yourself. But whatever you think it is, it's probably not not enough. Uh, so cash buffers are really, uh, really important. Um, one of the things that you mentioned just a few moments ago is that you need to fully expect good years and bad years. And in the good years, you need to be preparing for the for the bad years and in the bad years you need to be sort of hunkering down it's like you know um planting the crops in the spring and then hunkering down in the winter so mm. think think of the economy like seasons winter spring summer uh, autumn and, and so on um and the only way you get through is by uh by having cash flow buffers uh and that i think that was uh, it's an extremely obvious lesson but never have i seen rates go up this quickly uh, i don't think it's ever happened that quickly before so cash flow buffers were the the name of the game um last year and they will be again this year mm. yeah i think that's a very very good point john i think uh you know it's that's like the lifeline of a property investor you know they yeah. say it's easy to buy a property but it's difficult to hold on to the property long term right but yeah. in order to get the gain from the capital gains of the property you do need to hold the property long term because that's yeah. where the compounding actually happens around year 10 plus onwards so yeah um yeah so absolutely true you know the um the, the cash buffers is is crucial and you're right john i think um even it was especially critical last year but it's same as this year i gotta say um I know a lot of people have, unfortunately, with uh, high rates and inflation has started depleting and eating into their savings yeah. last year. So um, 2024 is probably a good time to review your portfolio if you haven't already done it um, to see, you know, am I am I going into negatives in order to hold on to the properties yeah. at the moment? Because, yeah, even though there's been talks about interest rate reductions, but we haven't really seen anything and you know, we, we're probably at the peak of the interest rate right now um, already. Mm. But when 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 are rates starting to be cut in Australia? We don't know. At the moment, there's a lot of yeah. uncertainty. So, you know, as a, as a general advice, John, would you would you suggest that, you know, we still got to prepare 
maybe more towards end of the year. So you're still going to have at least nine months of current repayments up until pretty much end of the year. So if you have enough buffers to be able to cover for that, you might be okay, ideally more. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts? How much? How well, long? So I think, uh, I mean, uh, one of the lessons perhaps is that interest rates aren't the name of the game as, yep. as we probably expected that they were. But parking that and talking about buffers, yep. rates are probably coming down in the US in May and probably coming down in Australia in September or October. So we're probably stuck at these levels for the greater part of this year, even though mm. I don't expect mm -hmm. rates to come down later in the year. And the only reason they would come down earlier is if something bad happened. Uh, so so we're, we're stuck with high interest rates. And the other thing is they're not going to go down as quickly as they went up. So even if they drop interest rates by half a percent, is that really materially going to, going to benefit you? Probably not. Yes. So you're going to need to manage your cash flow or get a, another source of income yep. or something like that for the for the... Uh, next couple of years, I would I would suggest, even though I totally agree we're at the terminus rate, uh, rates are coming down from here. We're still n not at the emergency COVID levels, and in the knock on effect to cash flow is that we're going to need to manage this for a few more years. Very true. Okay. All right. Um, number two over to, over to you. Number two over to me. Okay. So one of the observations I had last year was um, the property supply has been an issue and it's been a massive issue across a number of years. But I think in 2023, it got exacerbated to the next level, uh, mainly due to the extensive migration. I think we had like half a million people coming in within 2023. And that's across, um, you know, whereas I think traditionally it was around the 250, 200, 250K. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a massive number of immigration that came in in 2023. We didn't build as much during that period. In fact, I think um, only 166,000 new dwellings were come approved in the 12 months to December. That, uh, uh, sorry, to the end of October. That's uh, that's according to the um, uh, the, the the ABS. Um, which is actually at the level since June 20, 2013. You know, June 2013 nice. was around 165. Um, and last year up to October was 166. So this is, you know, the the um, the amount of, um, you know, like the, the, the undersupply that we're seeing right now is outrageous, which is unfortunately leading to a surge of rental prices. Like you mentioned, John, if, you, um, if you're not increasing rent in 2023, I mean, you would probably be unable to actually <laughs> survive as a, as a property investor, as a landlord. Um, yeah, and massive massive undersupply issue, which is actually going to be continuing to be the case, I would say, in the foreseeable future. As much as I hate to deny it, but that's that pins the foundation of property prices continues to go to grow in the long term, because yes. you know demand supply, we have an over. Uh, we have basically a massive shortage of supply, but the demand is still very, very strong on a yeah. local level. So, um, so yeah, so I think that's one of the reasons why I'm still very bullish in terms of the property in the long run. Um, you know, at least at least up until maybe towards twenty thirty at this point, yeah, or right, end of right. this that's towards all, the yeah. end of this decay. Um, because this issue is not going to get solved quickly. I mean, you know, we're we're not. Um, yeah, and they're not putting any incentives in terms of allowing private developers to build more. Yes, they're regulating them even more. They're um, regulating them even yeah. more, so they're going the other way. Um, even though the uh, the Albanese government has now started to cut back in terms of immigration, but look, you know, we've already got half a million people more in Australia right now. You know, the infrastructure hasn't been improved. Yeah, unfortunately, the roads are still the same. So. There's going to be more competition, and I expect there will be more competition. As a matter of fact, I think starting 2024, everyone's already been looking at property right now. Yeah. So far. And, you know, John, I think we thought it's going to be a quiet year. Maybe maybe it's not going to be a quiet property year. It might not be. It yeah. might not be. So anyway, um, I digress a little bit. So, yes, so back to uh, undersupply. So I think the undersupply issue is continuing going to be a challenge this year. Yeah. Um, 
Hence the reason why, you know, I think we are still going to see the property prices continue to grow and, yep. and, and rent is also continue to grow as well, even though at a softer rate. Yes, yes. I totally agree. I mean, I, I, I see immigration partly as a bit of a Ponzi scheme. I think it's that no federal government wants a recession on their watch. So yes. what we do is, and if you're measured by aggregate demand, because we've got some crazy Keynesian formula for GDP, you just need more spending. That's all. You, so if you can import the consumers you and import a taxpayer, it's much easier than growing a taxpayer. So, uh, so, and it's bipartisan, like but both sides of uh, yes. um, government want this. And, um, and so we just have lots of people coming in and, and we'll figure out the resource requirements later on. I I was reading this very interesting article in a in an economics magazine yesterday because I'm that sort of boring guy, and it was something like the heading was something quite interesting which I'd never thought of before. It said we've got to stop calling education an export. Education is not an export. Education is an extension of our immigration policy. Mm-hmm. Ed- education is an import. Dot 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 of people. I said yeah, that's 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 probably a good way to, to think of edu- you know education um but nonetheless i digress i think there'll be shortages for the for the um foreseeable future foreseeable meaning just the next couple of years five years sounds like a yeah. about right um and what it means for real estate is is that either the prices will be going up or the rents will be going up and if you're an investor you you'd take either uh we tend to just look at prices but when uh, your rents are going up. That's your return as well. Correct. And it shouldn't be ignored. So, yeah, I, I can't imagine that we're going to solve the shortage problem this year. So 2024 no. should be a reasonable reasonable year. Yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, yeah, that's a bit of an unfortunate situation, but it's it's where we stand. So, um, yeah. And I think I'm starting to get a bit of a FOMO um, in terms of from the property right. side of things right. as well, you know, because... Um, yeah, like they just they, they are starting to see so much competition in terms of properties and to the degree where they go, if I don't buy now, I'm gonna lose out and the price is just gonna to continue to go or keep going up and keep going up. So yes. um but yeah, be careful about the FOMO sentiments this year. Um there's you know, the media's done a fantastic job in terms of hyping properties and talking about properties and start talking about when interest rates gonna come down. But you know, I think ultimately Everyone needs to review their own financial circumstances. Um, and there's always going to be deals. There will always be deals. There will yep. always be properties to good properties to be bought anytime. So um, yeah. don't rush. Yeah, the media is going to report on the house in Concord that sold for 500000 over the reserve. But but that's not the average <laughs> result. So you, you've just got to, you, you've got to try to tune that out. That's right. All right, All right. over to you. All right. So my, mine is a similar, actually. My second one is to to ignore to have a healthy contempt for experts so all of the experts they have their their forecasts every year and certainly the forecast coming into 2023 i think with the exception of the spark your fire podcast <laughs> was that <laughs> was that real estate was going to get i mean don't forget real estate was tanking in 2022 wasn't yeah. supposed to go up because rates were going to go up and this sort of simplistic um expert class were saying that well rates go up therefore property prices come down and, and it didn't happen it didn't happen so not that experts are never right but if they're right it's a fluke uh so <laughs> no i'm being a bit i'm i'm exaggerating but um I'll be content, my man. point is not that not to not listen to people i would say decide, choose who you listen to carefully yes. my point is more when an expert makes a forecast about the real estate market, they never they never have your circumstances in mind. What what they're talking about is sort of general averages in the market, and sometimes they'll be right and sometimes they'll be wrong. Um, but but when you're buying real estate, you don't really care about what they're saying on Channel Seven. What you want to what you want to make your decision based on is um, what how old am I? How what do I earn? Uh, how much do I have saved? What are my objectives? And there's no there's no expert that can answer your question. So just just run your own race, uh, and and you know sort of pin your ears back and and sprint as fast as you can get to your own goals, because experts don't pay a price for being wrong either, uh, to to some degree. So yep. and and that's it, it was a very difficult it was very difficult to see real estate 
in a bullish light a year ago. So I, I you know, I'm being very forgiving, but um, my point is that it's irrelevant what they say anyway, because if you're a 25 year old who's about to get married, you should buy a house. There you go. What do you think of what do you think of my uh, don't listen to experts? Uh, <laughs> I, I would tend to agree, John. Um, but you would definitely want to listen to John. That's what oh, sure. yes, that, that's one of the guys that you definitely want to. <laughs> um, don't listen to me. Um, <laughs> not much. Um, but yes, I do agree with you. I think treat the um, what the experts call as a with a grain of salt. Uh, in honesty, um, we and even on on this podcast, we can only give general advice um, as well, right? Like our advice doesn't necessarily suit a lot of people. Um, Again, you know, we just, we can only give general advice and, you know, you need to review your own financial circumstances and decide what's going to be the best for you by yourself. Um, so totally don't get, don't get too caught up with the media news, um, you know, and run your own race. And one thing I will probably add as well is to, uh, is to actually look, do a bit of a medium term planning um, as well. So when you're buying an asset, when you're buying a, a property, you know, you don't want to be influenced just by the short um, duration, you know, by the time you hold. Yeah. Let's say, for example, you know, don't try to uh, don't don't try to sell just because, for example, land tax in Melbourne has already increased um, because of that. You know, you gotta you gotta look at it from a more of a medium to long term horizontal. Mm. Um, and I think that's that's good. You know, you always want to come back to say, why did I buy this property initially? And what have I got planned for it? And is it on track in terms of what I want to do with that property um, as well? If it's on track, fantastic. Okay, we'll keep holding it. But if it's not on track, what do you need to do in order to actually get that property on track in terms of what you want to achieve? So, yeah, yeah don't get influenced by the noise, which is a lot of noise in the media at the moment, especially the negativity towards property news, that kind of stuff. A lot of people can be driven by sentiment to sell because of those negativity. But don't be influenced by that. Just, um, yeah, have your plan, stick to it. Or if it's not going in the direction that it should be going, review and then fine tune. Simple as that. Yeah. Yeah, we, we tend to, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely guilty of this. You know, we try to say, well, what's property going to do in 2024? Who cares, right? right? Real estate over the last 50 years has gone up by 7% a year and it'll probably can you do that for the next 50 years. So I don't do you, should you care um what what real estate does in 2024? If you ask, you know, the the expert so I'm being fair to experts now. So the expert who predicted the property would go down in 2023. If you ask them a different question, which is will property prices go up between now and 2035? They'd probably say absolutely yes, and they would be right. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we ask the wrong questions and then don't like the answers we get. Maybe the 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 the, the problem is the questions that we're asking the experts rather than their answers. And you know the 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 media need to have a sensationalized title, and yeah. that's just how it's designed, right? So you know, like you mentioned, the the, the, the you know the um, the house that uh, that sold for five hundred k over reserve. There you go, classic example, eye catching, right? That's how yeah, they make yeah. their their revenue stream. So, again, don't caught up by those um, and um, run your own race, totally. Okay, Back to you, number Back three, to me, number three. Okay, so it's cheap somewhat related to um to what you just touched on uh, or what we touched on earlier my number three is uh talks about um property prices isn't actually necessary in proportion with how the interest rate behaves that's one of the observations that i found last year yeah like you mentioned so again tying to what you're saying you know the um a lot of economists or you know experts were forecasting sydney's going to come crashing down if interest rates continue to go up well has it we're now you know I think, um, you know, hindsight is a great thing. When we look at it back, say, Sydney actually done almost 10% last year on, on an annual level, right? So um, we four. So, so you know, basically that, and, and, and look, I was on a simplistic view of that. Yes, it's somewhat correlated to a degree, but obviously that didn't happen. So that's one of the eye-opening things because logic dictates that, Hey, interest rates so high, the repayment so high. How can people still continue to afford it? And Sydney at the moment is very, very unaffordable according to their scale, of course. Um, different to your scale, John, um, <laughs> in terms of how you measure 
um, gold. Sydney yeah. and versus gold. But yeah, I would have thought, okay, interest rate keeps going up. Sydney property prices is probably stagnant or even coming down a little bit. Didn't happen. It's driven a lot more by demand and supply. And part of that reason when I thought about it as well, in order to make sense of that is a lot of people may have stashed away a lot of money during COVID. And now they can afford to splurge and upgrade in Sydney. So therefore, they're not, you know, they may not necessarily take out such a big loan. They sold their place, which they had a bit of equity. They, they saved a lot of money during um, during COVID period. And now they afford to actually be able to get into that next level. And that's mm. maybe one of the, I'm just thinking out loud, it might be one of the reasons why Sydney market is still going quite strong, um, you know, with, uh, with, with very strong property prices. But yeah, that was definitely one of the biggest eye-opening items for me in 2023, you know, and um, yeah. That, that it, Sydney it, did Sydney did okay. I mean, Sydney did quite well. Correct. That, even though the, even the rate keeps upping and upping and right. up, you know. And, and and it didn't impact the sentiment much as well. I think, John, you've been, into, you've been to the inspections as well. Like, there's still a lot of people in auctions. I mean, now it's probably different. Like, you know, there might, there might not be many people that's putting their bid, but last year especially the first half of last year when interest rates still rising literally every month, yeah. there's still a lot of people attending and a lot yeah. of people putting through their bids, right? Not so, many properties. <laughs> on the properties. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, so that's my uh, that's my number three in terms of the observations. What do you yeah, think? I like it. I like it. Look, uh, I mean, I think I think we all to um, – we, we, we forget that real estate is just accommodation. And, you know, we think about it like we're buying Telstra shares or or an, a pure investment, but real estate isn't a pure investment. It's primarily accommodation and it's actually an investment sort of second or third down the list. Yes. What that means is, is most of the buyers are owner occupiers. And what that means is if you live in Sydney and uh, um, Perth is undervalued, who cares? Um, th- that That's going to appeal to a small segment of, in- of property investors, but I want to buy a house so that I'm, I'm near I'm near mum and dad and I'm near my in-laws and whatever it is so I'm going to buy in Sydney and if Sydney's overvalued I'm still going to buy in Sydney because this is where my family is and this is where my job is yep so um Sydney may well be overvalued and it's still not going to matter because 70 percent of the buyers out there and plus a car drive investors are still going to want to live where all the things that are important to them are yep. so there will always be Sydney will always have a premium to some degree. Now, more you know, Sydney is uh, Brisbane is outperforming Sydney at the moment, but that doesn't mean Sydney you know will do badly. It just means that Brisbane will do better, and 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 that that'll happen until Brisbane's not as compelling and it's like a big weighing machine, yeah. as Benjamin Graham said. Mm. But no, no, no. I think that's a. I think I th- I, I really like your number three, uh, uh, just about you know how we perceive expensive and how we perceive overvalued and where, to what extent that matters when we're talking about some of the big capital cities which are always expensive and unaffordable yeah yeah no absolutely and um you know i think what you what you were talking about there just uh, reminded me you know i've got a client who was looking at uh you know his budget was around 900 and he was looking around sydney in terms of what he can get for his family as an occupy house but eventually he decided to actually buy something in Melbourne because for that same price, he can get a house yeah. in Melbourne. Yep. Whereas in Sydney, you'd probably be able to get away with two bedroom, um, you know, right. units, apartments. So mm. again, you know, this, this, this client doesn't quite have the family, et cetera, route here in Sydney. So they're not fussed in terms of moving different cities, but from the value perspective that I think that's a great example from the value perspective, you know, you you potentially may get much more value outside of Sydney at the moment uh, from a living quality style, depending on what people like and and et cetera, et cetera. But like, you know, John, you are, you know, obviously a, someone who's been here for a long time. Your families are all here. Your roots are already here. You love the coffee shop that's just down the road, mm-hmm. of course. So, you know, you want that lifestyle, then you'll pay a premium. Um, yeah. You're happy to pay that premium as well. Yeah. Look, the, the one way to think about it, a city is cities benefit from the network effect to use a tech term, right? So think of Facebook. The more people that use Facebook, the more valuable Facebook gets. And every time a new joiner joins Facebook, Facebook becomes more valuable and, and Facebook becomes more ind- indispensable. The more people uh, join Facebook, Bitcoin's the same. The more people 
uh, adopt Bitcoin, the more valuable it gets. And the more valuable it gets, the more people adopt Bitcoin. And the more people adopt Bitcoin, the more valuable it gets. And yeah. cities are the same thing. So the more people move to a city, the more indispensable it becomes and and the more valuable it gets. And the, then the more valuable it gets, the more people move to the city and then the more people move to the city and, and so on and so on. So cities are a physical network um, like Facebook, like Bit, Bitcoin. And the more people that come here, the more valuable it gets. Yeah. So, yeah. Perfect. I've never compared Sydney to Bitcoin before, but there's a first time. Is <laughs> that going to be your next uh, comparison? Yeah. Instead of using <laughs> gold, let's change that to Bitcoin and see how that's Well, uh, it would work. I, I have to think about it, uh, but there might be an article in there somewhere um, <laughs> rattling around the back of my mind. All right. I'll pass the baton back to you, mate. All right. So the, my, my last one, I think there might be a bonus one after this, but my last one was essentially just buy the best quality asset that you can. Mm -hmm. And the reason that's a lesson for 2023 is because in 2023, rates started going up and it became harder to hold assets. So you needed to, the best you could, pass on as much of that that increased cost as you could to your tenant. Yeah. Um, and and your ability to do that depends on how good the asset is. So if you if you've got a premium asset, you can you can put the rent up, and if you don't, you can't. Uh, so. The people who, again, are, are sort of surviving and even thriving in, in these higher interest rate environments are the people with good quality assets um, or, or multiple assets because you, they're, they're not, not dissimilar. But the quality assets are going to hold their value and you're going to be able to pass on you're going to be able to pass on rent increases if you own if you own better uh, better assets. And I think that that was a, a a lesson. If you could put your rent up in 2023, you, you you've done better. No, oh, very good. I think, yeah, certainly that's true. And, and you know, I think if you now compare the amount of rent increases for a good quality property as opposed to maybe a property in a lower social demographic area, which I had had a few, um, you'll see the, the rental proportion and the capital growth proportion is very yeah. different. Yeah, and this is right. where the gap started to widen as well. Um, you know, I think... Um, from memory, actually, from from memory, yeah, in in Logan now, so a, a suburb called Crestme. You probably don't know this too much, John, but um, for those people who have looked into Logan, uh, Crestme is kind of like a middle class suburb within Logan. Um, mm. 2017, 2018, they used to sell around the 350 to 400k mark. I think it's now more soaring towards 700 at right. the moment. Whereas, let's say, for example, uh, you know, properties in Woodridge, Logan Central, sort of lower social demographic areas. You can probably fetch them around 250, 300 marks. So, you know, around 100K less. Now they're around the 500 mark. Yeah, right. So, mm. you know, the rate of the growth is different. And same thing with their rent as well. The rent growth right. portion is, is different. So, um, but yeah, definitely, definitely agree with you there, mate. Um, there's no, you know, we buy quality assets where you can. And I think that's where you can always yeah. an important yeah. rule. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What awesome. about the bonus? You said you said you said you want to share some bonus there, John. I did, I did. Uh, so this was, you know, interestingly, this was a, a t the the final one is pay down debt. Mm -hmm. um, now this is a contentious because um, I think that you know we we last time we talked about paying down debt, you and I had a a, a disagreement, and we had comments uh, in the on our channel and uh, via social media as well, mainly uh, agreeing with you and, and disagreeing with me, but. I'm I'm stubborn and persistent, so you want to give I that. reckon a 2023 lesson was to 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 try to pay down debt in the good times. Yep. Um, if you buy a property and you've got the same amount of debt as when you purchased it five or six, ten years ago, it's fine if interest rates aren't going up. But once interest rates go up, you're essentially essentially in no better a position, although you probably have a bit more equity. Um, but in terms of your ability to manage the debt. Um, I, I I feel like you, without extinguishing debt rather than managing debt, uh, I, I think that 2023 would have been difficult for you. But if instead over, say, 2020 to 2023, you've been paying off some debt, now you're managing, let's say, 15% or 10% less uh, debt or debt less principal than you had a couple of years ago, I think that it would have made a, a difference. I also think that it would have been easier for you to refinance if you've got less debt than you started with, say, four or five uh, years ago. So I think that there's always a... When, when rates are rising as quickly as they did, um, 
it's obviously the rates are calculated off off the debt you've got. So if you've got less debt, I think it would 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 be easier to handle. So yeah, I mean, I I think that sort of ties into a philosophy that I have, which is to not let tax considerations drive your investing decisions. Mm-hmm. If 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 tax is the driver, but you can't hold the asset, then it's that's no good as well. So I think paying off some debt because tax deductibility is not your only consideration in a property portfolio, I think was a lesson from 2023. Yeah. Yeah. No, look, Back I, to you. Yeah, look, I think we've, um, we've always had some uh, disagreements around this area, but I can certainly see where it's coming from, uh, John. Um, I think it's it comes down to risk mitigation at the end of the day. Yeah. It's all about risk mitigation, right? Um, if... And there's no wrong in terms of paying down the debt. You know, it's not like I I, I would go against it. But I think, again, it, it circles back to at what stage of the journey are you on? Are you currently mm. still on an acquisition journey? Are you on a consolidation phase? Um, what stage are you currently at, right? So, um, and then you want to focus the resources at different stages. Um, if you're at the consolidation stage, yes, you definitely want to be able to pay down some of the debt uh, in that sense. And you know, to to actually lower your overall risk um, and be able to hold the property uh, portfolio longer. I think 2023, certainly with uh, big portfolio holders like us, and, you know, even on interest only, it was very negative from a cash flow perspective. And it's really challenging into the household cash flow managing capability. If you're just on a PAYG income, it's very difficult. Um, And that's why a lot of people had to eat into savings in order to hold onto the property or they had to sell the property in that sense, right? So um, whereas, let's say, for example, if you are really good with cash flow management um, and you're able to hold it out, no issues. Um, but, you know, if you had a bit of extra money, you can also pay down the debt at that point in time as a once-off. Um, so that way it reduces the overall risk. Um, and that's debt reduction and that's risk mitigation and control. Yeah. So. Definitely has a place, John. I think, you know, we've seen the lower rates. We've seen the high rates like last year. Um, a good a good one to mention again to our listeners. Um, you know, certainly everyone's situation is different. Um, what my strategy and what John's strategy may not necessarily be applicable to you. Um, best for you to review what you're comfortable with because um, ultimately we don't want you to be sleeping at night yeah. and worry about debt as well yeah. if yeah. that's yeah. the case you need to start looking at some principal reduction to be able to deal better no one went bankrupt by not having by having too little debt <laughs> do you know what i mean like that takes a special kind of moron uh if you, 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 only people with too much debt go bankrupt so yeah no that's true and on the same token though john i think um a lot of people are still anti-debt in today's environment. Um, mm. and, and and to that degree, you know, I might just add that as a footnote too. Um, I actually think it's uh, probably a silly thing not to have any good debt in today's environment um, because of the inflationary nature of our currency, right? Your money putting into the savings account while it may earn you 5.5% or whatever savings rate at the moment looks fantastic, but the money keeps getting eroded away in the long yep. run. So you definitely want to have some of the good debt with you, maybe park against property um, in that sense. So that way it hedges against that inflation. So that's my view. Um, yeah, because I had multiple conversations with different clients who, you know, say, oh, you know, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be holding any debt. You should just basically get one property, mm-hmm. pay it down, then look at the next one. Well, how long is it going to take you to actually pay it down one property? Yeah. By the time you do that, your working life using credit, yes. John, your working life is pretty much gone. Bank's not going to yeah. lend you anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's true. I think there's a, there's a, there's a balance in there. Mm. You know, it just occurred to me as well, there's one one expression we haven't heard this year. Uh, remember everyone was talking about the cliff, the, the interest, the fixed interest cliff. Yes. No one's hearing about the fixed interest cliff. Fixed we, rate, fixed rate this cliff is, for last year. The uh, fixed rate uh, cliff. Yeah. So that, that turned out, to, don't believe cliffs. Cliffs uh, assume everyone's going through the same thing at exactly the same time. Um, yeah. <laughs> don't worry about cliffs. Um, but that, that that I remember that. And there's always going to be another cliff in the future. We're going to say, oh, don't worry about a cliff. It's like, don't worry about the cliff. Um, yeah. And coming and coming back to that, you know, when there's a cliff, there's always a mitigation strategy. The banks were allowing people to refinance at a lower buffer rate, right? So that people don't have to be stuck with that. So, um, but again, 
uh, you know, uh, you need to review your own financial circumstances yeah, and, yeah, and be yeah. comfortable with it. So awesome. Thanks, John. Yeah. Anything else to wrap up with? Not not at all. Just a good chat. And we'll, look, we'll, we'll resume with a variety of topics um, here on Spark Your Fire. And, and if you if there's anything you'd like us to talk about, um, pop us a comment in the, yeah. uh, pop us an email in the comment below. Definitely. Definitely. Yep. And uh, I think um, uh, the the word on the street is that jazz might be coming back onto this pod again, John. <laughs> I don't know when, but, uh, you know, this year, for those people who's uh, very happy with jazz, he's disappeared for one year, but he's coming back. Uh, he's making a comeback this year talking about financial markets again. So listeners, tune in. Make sure you you, you continue to check out the new episodes and, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll continue to share our latest uh, thoughts and yeah. our figures on this, okay? Well, have a good week, everyone, and uh, we'll see you again in another episode of Spark Your Fire. John and David, bye.